Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the State Department. Happy Thursday. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, just one thing briefly at the top, and then I'll go to your questions. Uh, as many of you saw, I think we already issued the uh, travel warning, uh, as well as a, a brief comment by uh, me. Uh, but uh, the Department of State and Department of Defense have authorized the voluntary departure of family members uh, of U.S. personnel stationed at Injerlik Air Base, as well as our consulate in Adana, Turkey. Uh, this decision was made out of an abundance of caution uh, following the commencement of military operations out of Injerlik Air Base. Uh, certainly, the safety and security of U.S. citizens living abroad are top priorities, uh, and we take very seriously the responsibility for ensuring the security um, of members of the entire official American community, and we'll continue to evaluate our security posture in Turkey as well as worldwide. That's it. Matt, over here. Uh, very briefly on yeah, that. Yeah, sure. I, 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 just, I, I want to know if you can be a little bit more specific about what it means out of an abundance of caution. What are you worried about? Are you worried about attacks that, that, that the consulate in Adana or Interlick might, or institutions or people affiliated with them might be attacked because of the Turkish involvement in the airstrikes or because they have, the Turks have allowed Interlick to be used? What what, so, what exactly is the concern? First of all, as as you, I think, noted, it's this is precautionary, um, and it's in line with how we generally postured ourselves uh, in other locations, uh, frankly, that are in the vicinity of active military operations, which is what's going on at Interlick now. Um, but, you know, bear in mind, uh, this is, and important to note, that this is, A, voluntary, uh, and B, uh, uh, it's uh, which, as opposed to ordered, as you know, uh, but also be it's uh, also for dependents of uh, official families. So, why the delay? Yeah, well, why the well, delay? Wait, wait a second. But Please, that, that, that's a fine answer, but it wasn't an answer to my question. What is it that you're concerned about? What is the abundance oh. of precaution for? I mean, presumably, you don't think a Turkish jet is going to accidentally no. drop bombs on the American, you know, the the, the consulate. Of course not. But so what? So what is it you're concerned? Is it the PKK? Is it ISIS? Is it is it uh, you know some other kind of? Is it I mean, terror? I'm not going to get into specific threats. Certainly, uh, our travel <clears throat> uh, speaks for itself. But uh, you know, it's just uh, it's an acknowledgement uh, that the threat level is increased due to military activities now going out of that base. Well, I guess the other Please, way, go ahead. I guess the other way to put my sure. question is, if uh, there were to be this agreement between the U.S. and the Turkish government, and now there is this agreement, why wasn't a voluntary departure authorized at the time of the agreement? What's, what's, why has this taken several weeks for this to happen? Well, uh, again, we're constantly evaluating the security situation, uh, you know, uh, and uh, we take uh, decisions or make decisions about uh, uh, both voluntary and authorized departure, uh, based on our assessment. Uh, I, you know, there's, it's not, not on any given timeline, uh, but uh, you know, we uh, we operate out of an abundance of caution in making these kinds of decisions. But wouldn't it have been reasonable to assume that there might have been the potential for any sort of retaliatory attack, in light of the U.S. being allowed to fly out of Insirlik? It Wouldn't it, I'm sorry. Wouldn't it be safe to what, assume? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been reasonable to assume that there might be? some sort of retaliatory attack. Again, I, moved into I'm not going to speak, you know, to the specifics of how we evaluate the security and the dangers that are out there. Uh, we don't often do that uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, it's a decision we made. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we put out a travel warning. Uh, it's specific to these two locations, not throughout Turkey. I'll leave it at that. How many families does that involve? Uh, we don't give out precise numbers. Um, that's okay. Ballpark. Yeah, no, ballpark. Um, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, there's, uh, we're talking, it's not a large number of people, uh, probably under 100 or so. It, it's, not hundred, hundred, it's not 100 families. It's far more than 100 families. You're talking about 100, 100 people that might be? The Pentagon, your colleague at the Pentagon said it was about 900, 900. the universe. I'm sorry, I'm talking about... You're talking about the State yes, Department. Yes, I apologize. Gotcha. So, Ish, Department. No, I'm not, I can't, I really, I, I'm sorry, I've already <laughs> In the same overstepped. We don't give, we don't give out uh, precise numbers for security reasons. Yeah, please. In the same travel warning, uh, you also talk about... Uh, 
U.S. citizens should be alert to the potential for violence in Turkey and also U.S. citizens to avoid demonstrations and uh, even large gather, uh, other large gatherings, even if they are peaceful. So it is not only Adana, but also it, it seems like you have some broader concern over Turkey. I mean, look, I mean, that, that's somewhat standard language uh, that we give to travelers, uh, you know, and somewhat uh, part of that is just good common sense. Uh, you know, you shouldn't go to a large gathering or a, a protest or whatever, uh, in a demonstration uh, in a country. But it's prudent uh, not to engage in those kinds of things. Uh, but uh, certainly this is advice we give to travelers, to Americans traveling abroad in many different places. Uh, specifically, I I have to see the exact language that it, whether it t refers to all of Turkey. Again, this travel warning and this author uh, author sorry this voluntary departure is specific to Adana and Injilik. Please. Uh, you also, also in, the, in the travel warning you, you mentioned the, uh, the the region the southern east uh, of Turkey, which is the Kurdish populated area, uh, where the the fighting between PKK and the Turkish uh, government Turkish army is uh, happening. Uh, so was, there there's already critics of this that you are trying to justify the Turkish act, Turkish government's action of arresting uh, American and Western uh, journalists that to cover the, the conflict in that area. What's your response to that? I, I yeah, you want to justify just, that? Okay. You want to you want to warn you, you, your citizens and the people that these areas are not safe. So if the journalists go in there, so the Turkish uh, government will arrest them, not for the reason that they don't want to, uh, they don't want them to cover the events. Well, but also sure. To, if you're specifically talking about the uh, vice uh, journalists uh, who were arrested not the other day, other we, also. we were very clear in uh, in saying that uh, you know that uh, you know we'd expect uh, any uh, investigation and charges against journalists and any uh, arrests of journalists, uh, obviously, to follow uh, uh, certainly in a democracy like Turkey, <clears> follow. Uh, uh, Due process and, and uh, be backed up by good evidence. I think his question was kind of: uh, Did the U.S. government do this as to give the Turkish government a pretext to go after journalists in these areas? Presumably, the answer no. is no. No. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Can, <laughs> Thanks. Can for I shot. can I switch to Iran? Um, sure. So the uh, uh, the Iranian supreme leader made some comments uh, this morning that appeared to suggest that he favored the Iranian majlis uh, parliament taking, uh, you know, voting on the nuclear deal. Although I realize there's some potential ambiguity in what he said. We quote him as saying, uh, parliament should not be sidelined on the nuclear deal issue, dot, dot, dot. I'm not saying lawmakers should approve the deal or reject it. It is up to them to decide, close quote. And Quote, I've told the president that it is not in our interest to not let our lawmakers review the deal, close quote, referring to President Rouhani. Do you have any comment on the utility of an Iranian uh, parliamentary vote on this? Do you think that that would be a good thing so that Iran could see whether there's a wider support in the country? Uh, no, for, I mean, for I, I don't have comment one way or the other. I mean, we don't generally respond to public uh, comments by uh, Iran's supreme leader. Um, you know, I've seen those remarks. Uh, uh, I would just say the JCPOA, uh, its text, its annexes are clear uh, in spelling out what needs to be done uh, for all parties to start to benefit from uh, its successful implementation. Uh, but uh, as to, you know, internal uh, Iranian debate over uh, the passage of it, uh, that's that's up to them. And then se second thing, just related, sure. does the department have any reason to believe that Secretary Kerry's uh, speech yesterday uh, has changed any minds in either uh, the Senate or the House? Have you gotten any indications from anyone that they're now favoring the deal <clears throat> when they weren't uh, previously? Uh, uh, Good question. Um, I, I'm not sure. No, we we haven't seen any immediate reaction. Certainly, it was uh, as we talked about uh, yesterday. Uh, well, and, you've got and another side, right? We do, but uh, I can't positively link the two. Is what I'm saying. Uh, but I like to think that it's part of, uh, you know, uh, uh, our attempt uh, to continue. And the secretary is certainly at the forefront of this. Our attempt to, uh, uh, to. Uh, explain what this deal means for the American public, uh, as well as for the region uh, and the world, and uh, and that's to prevent uh, Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. 
Uh, and uh, we've said before, we've seen uh, obviously an increase in congressional support. Uh, that's encouraging, uh, but uh, uh, we're certainly not going to take our foot off the gas pedal. Uh, so um, on this, yes, the, yes the, there has been, an, I suppose you could call it an increase in congressional support, but you're, the, there's no way that you're going to get a majority of, of, uh, peop of, of senators uh, or even close to anything like a, uh, you know, a, a significant minority of the House to vote in favor of it. Um, so while the numbers are increasing, they're still quite low. No, is that a disappointment to you? And secondly, related to that, Senator Booker, when he came out and said he would support it today, um, echoed the comments of many uh, recent yes vote <coughs> announcements uh, by saying that you know, this is a deeply flawed agreement and other comments have been not the agreement I was hoping for, or was looking for, or expected. Um, you know, serious reservations about it, but we'll still vote yes. These are hardly ringing endorsements. Is that of concern? Um, well, uh, again, we've been uh, uh, from the Secretary to the President to Secretary mm -hmm. Moniz to others, uh, um, Secretary of Treasury Jack Lew, uh, uh, have been uh, engaged, uh, certainly Wendy Sherman as well, uh, with Congress trying to answer every question uh, that they may have on this uh, this uh, agreement. Uh, we've always said every vote matters. We want to see that increase. Um, you know, our goal fundamentally is uh, we want to see the administration to be able to implement this deal, right. uh, whatever that takes in Congress. So, uh, you know, uh, your first question was, are we disappointed? Uh, I think we're seeing uh, or we're uh, we're neither disappointed, but we're not satisfied. We think we can we can get more uh, approval votes or yes votes. And uh, sorry to answer your other question about your second question about um, uh, about the, some of the, uh, uh, the 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 statements about support for the deal. Um, you know, uh, this is for each senator and congressperson to weigh uh, as they make their decision. But uh, you know. We've made the case repeatedly that this is the best possible deal that prevents Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Right, but yeah. if you look at the recent statement, I mean, there are very few met lawmakers who have come out in support of this who are as, you know, um, enthusiastic as uh, members of the administration are, particularly those in the administration who actually negotiated the deal. So I'm just, I, I just wonder is, and, and all of these lawmakers who have come out with their support, Ostensible, ostensible support. Sure. Uh, well, it's not ostensible. Yeah, they say they'll vote yes. Right. It is support. So, but all, but but many of them recently have they've listened to all the arguments made. Uh, they listened to the case that that you presented to them in classified and unclassified form, and they still say, "This is not what I had hoped or for." Or as in the case of Senator Booker today, this is deeply flawed. It, it, the administration does not believe that it's deeply flawed, does it? Of course not. So the um, case had. So, yeah. so are you satisfied that the case has actually been made? I, I think, to some extent, you know, we're confident that uh, once this agreement uh, is implemented, that that it won't be deeply that the flawed proof, anymore. That the proof will be in the pudding. That we'll see an yeah. Iran that's unable to uh, obtain a nuclear weapon right. that is still kept in check by uh, remain, uh, continuing sanctions. I'll stop after, yeah, I'll stop after those. So is it, it's fair to say that despite the fact that this, uh, the, the support that you've been getting in some of the recent yep. statements has not been, you know, 100% rah-rah, go team, it's been far le more reserved. You're, that's not a disappointment for you. You're just happy to get the yes vote. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yes. of course we're happy okay. to get the yes vote, exactly. <laughs> And I won't, uh, I, I promise I won't give you the uh, entire, uh, I won't repeat the Secretary's speech yesterday, which Thank you. made it very clear why this is a good agreement. Please, Guy. Um, I asked you the other day about uh, refugees from Syria and the resettlement here, and there was, um, I was a, a little confused about whether it was 1,500 per fiscal year you'd allowed in or whether that was the total since the start of the war. Uh, and I know there's a reporting moment coming up before the end of this month where the President has to uh, report what the plan is for 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 2016. I know in the light of the the photographs that have shocked the world coming out of Europe that there's more pressure now uh, for countries to come forward and Germany's made a uh, made a big offer for for resettlement. I uh, just wanted to check in with you today before we write about this. What, 
uh, sure. what your latest figures are yeah. and what your, your stance is. Sure. Well, uh, as you uh, um, alluded to in your question, uh, certainly we were all shocked uh, by uh, some of the very graphic and heartbreaking uh, images that we've seen from uh, Europe uh, today. Uh, clearly, uh, this situation is very complex and certainly very urgent as we see uh, individual nations trying to handle the huge influx of migrants. Um, we strongly support, uh, in that respect, uh, the European Union's efforts to resolve uh, this issue in a comprehensive manner. We welcome the news that the EU is going to meet on September 14th to discuss this situation in depth and formulate a uh, coordinated uh, response. Uh, we recognize this is an enormous challenge. Uh, uh, and uh, commend those leaders, uh, some of whom you mentioned, uh, and citizens in Europe who have responded with uh, compassion and generosity uh, to this uh, crisis. Um, you know, and then uh, I'll get to specifics about our uh, some of the numbers you asked about. But just would add that you know any solution to these kinds of migration challenges uh, certainly uh, should focus on saving and protecting lives, ensuring human rights of all migrants are respected and promoting uh, orderly and humane migration policies. Now, in response to your question, which was about some of the numbers I gave the other day, mm -hmm. uh, about so that was correct. I said that the United States is likely to admit uh, roughly 1,800 uh, Syrian refugee, refugees total by the end of this fiscal year, which is October. Um, we've certainly, um, uh, in light of the significant number of Syrian refugees, uh, uh, displaced. Uh, we've made substantial efforts uh, this year to facilitate increased uh, refugee emissions in this popula from this population. So, oh, yeah, please. Was, there, was, yeah, there was an ambiguity about this. Do you mind if I follow yeah, up? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I have some more though. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, sure. I don't think what you said was right in the sense that you were, there was a conflation of since the beginning of the conflict versus since uh, during the course of this fiscal year. So just so there's no ambiguity, and I, I got a response on this, and you may you may have it. Right. But my understanding was that since the beginning of the conflict, you've gotten 17,000 Syrian refugee referrals. Referrals, correct. That since the beginning of the conflict, the United States government has accepted 1,500. And we expect to reach 1,800 by the end of this fiscal year. That's okay. what I was, you, if and I then, was, and yes, but in other words, that's not another eighteen hundred. It's just another three hundred. Correct. The end of the that's correct. Year. That's correct. Okay, yeah. It. No, I'm sorry. If, if I was unclear on that, I meant you're absolutely right. It's the beginning of the conflict, and then I meant to say that the ending. Well, we hope to reach that uh, eighteen hundred uh, mark uh, by the uh, by the end of this fiscal year, in, in just a, a few weeks, frankly. So that's about four hundred fifty yeah. per year. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, we've put significant resources behind this in the past year to really to, I mean, this is, it's an extensive review process, certainly uh, folks coming from uh, that part of the world, uh, that region, uh, um, we need to obviously conduct a, a thorough uh, review process. I, uh, I've been told it takes anywhere up to 18 to 24 months, so it's, it's, um, it's uh, time consuming. Okay, Please I went, ahead, all right. I went, I okay. Think, yeah. Sorry, yeah, sure, sure, sorry. Okay. I don't think but it's so. right to say about 450 since the beginning of the, you know, per year, mm -hmm. because the conflict, of course, it's, in That's fact, right, the too, majority is yes. this fiscal yes. year, yes. right? We, we, we put additional resources. Yeah. I don't have that clear breakdown. I can try to get it for you. But yeah, we've we've amped up or ramped up our uh, our ability to process. I'll be giving those. a background yeah. briefing. On that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Arshad. Okay, so I've uh, I went back and took a look at uh, the numbers of people who have been admitted um, under U.S. RAP, the Refugee Admission Program, uh, regarding Syria, since 2011 when the civil war started. 852 people have actually been resettled in the U.S. 29 in 2011, 31 in 12, 36 in 13. 105 and 14, so far in fiscal year 2015, which started October 1st, 651. Part of the reason I have been told from people at DHS, which oversees the actual screening, is the background check. Yep. There's also the political component on Capitol Hill. There's a very anti-immigrant sentiment on Capitol Hill right now and in this country, and you have had members of Congress, including Congressman McFaul of Texas, who deals with Homeland Security issues, saying that they are very concerned about members of ISIL, Al-Qaeda, and other terrorist groups using the refugee admission program as a way of trying to gain access 
to the United States, and they want to see, in essence, a slow roll on the admission of any additional Syrian refugees. When you're dealing with the fact that there is an annual worldwide cap for 70,000 refugees to come to the United States, not just from Syria, from all other countries, and then you're dealing with this political sentiment on Capitol Hill, how is it possible for the U.S. to say that it is doing everything possible to try to help the millions of people who have been displaced, who have had to leave Syria, not the nine million inside Syria? How can the U.S. argue that it is doing everything possible to help these people when you're dealing, one, with such a small number of people who can be admitted, and a Congress which has to agree to the number of people admitted as refugees to this country. The president can't just sign an executive order and let people in. Okay. Um, big question. Uh, let me start with what you correctly said, which is that these individuals, these refugees, uh, uh, asylum seekers who are being considered by DHS have to pass security background checks. Mm -hmm. um, precisely because of some of the factors that you raised, which is that, you know, the fear from, you know, there's a lot of terrorist groups operating in that region, in that part of the world, and we need to make sure that uh, fundamentally that we protect uh, the national security of the United States of America. So any asylum seeker uh, has to go through a thorough background check. And I spoke to that a little bit about when I talked about the 18 to 24 month review process. Mm -hmm. um, you said, how can you say that the United States is doing enough in uh, to respond to that, I would simply say, you know, we've provided and, you know, the four point one billion dollars in humanitarian assistance since the start of the crisis, which is more than any other single donor uh, to help address the humanitarian crisis uh, by the, I guess, almost seven, seven point five or even eight million uh, displaced people, both inside Syria, certainly, but also the four million uh, Syrian refugees mm -hmm. uh, throughout the region particularly in Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in Jordan, uh, in Iraq, as well as in Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we are committed to uh, maintaining a robust refugee admission program. Uh, and we are certainly aware of the needs of the Syrian refugee population. Mm -hmm. And as you noted, we have raised our numbers uh, in the past year. We put more resources behind uh, some of these background checks. But the fact of the matter is they do need to uh, be thoroughly vetted. Uh, so I'll stop there. Yeah. Is, it reasonable, is it reasonable for this administration to even try to argue to Congress that absent cutting out those people who may be trying to escape political persecution in sub-Saharan Africa or in Southeast Asia or in some parts of Central America, you know, shifting the numbers around and giving those slots to Syrians? Is the administration willing to go to Congress and say, we need to raise the overall cap so that we can try to get more people in from Syria just because the pool sure. that is out there is just overwhelming and we would be remiss as a country if we don't try to bring in more citizens? Well, again, I, you know, a couple of points there. One is uh, certainly uh, you raise a valid point, which is, you know, as dire as the situation is in Syria, and in that region of the world, uh, there are indeed asylum seekers, uh, refugees, uh, migrants coming in from other parts of the world, and we need to consider their situation, their plight uh, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, I would also just say that when we look at this, and I spoke to this the other day, you know, refugee resettlement uh, and responding to a crisis, certainly as we're seeing in Europe right now, is uh, important. There's an urgency there. But the longer-term solution remains uh, a political resolution to the conflict in Syria and in other places, but mostly in Syria. And that's why we need a credible peace process. We need Assad to step aside. We need uh, a peace process that adheres to the Geneva communique that creates a stable, secure Syria. Uh, we need to destroy ISIS. We need to get ISIS out of the picture. We need to create an environment where these refugees can ultimately return home, which is where they want to be. Please go ahead. Barbara. Just two questions. One, you've made the case for the stringent background checks because of security issues. Is there any discussion or pressure for fast tracking at least some of the most vulnerable um, refugees coming from Syria? This is one. And the second is in the um, the statements made on this topic, the senator's letter in May, and then Nicholas Burns and David Miliband writing their op-ed in the 
International Rescue Committee um, statement, they've all been saying that traditionally the United States accepts half the refugees that the UNHCR approves for foreign resettlement, that that's the tradition. Um, What's the reason it's not happening now? Is it mainly the security issue, or is there something else? Because the, the, that number would be 65,000. The UNHCR has, has asked for 130,000 resettled. Um, I, I can't, uh, frankly, give you like a, you know, a, a, a response to the question of why the slowdown. Other than that, it does speak to the length of the process to, uh, uh, to review these uh, individuals. Uh, as I said, the, the you know, as compelling as these, uh, as it is, the situation of these refugees, um, you know, our first uh, priority is to maintain the national security of the United States, protect uh, American citizens. So that's certainly consideration. Um, uh, but uh, uh, what was your second question? I forgot now, Barbara. I asked if there was any move to fast track some of the most vulnerable refugees. Yeah. I mean, I think we're looking at a variety of options. I mean, certainly we recognize, um, you know, there's an urgency. I spoke to that. Um, I, can't, I don't have anything to announce necessarily in that regard, except for the fact that we have uh, improved our numbers uh, and, uh, and admitted more Syrian refugees. I realize that in, in relation to the, uh, the number of requests uh, uh, referred to us or referrals by the UNHCR, uh, it still seems small, but we have significantly raised those numbers. And Richards was saying that next year, the, she was expecting um, the U.S. would be accepting thousands. Do, is that like a, is there a figure that you're aiming towards? I don't. I mean, and we don't, uh, it's important to note, we don't have certain quotas or numerical targets uh, for any refugee group, including Syrians. Um, well, by region, you have we do targets. By, we, we, we have, well, we do. We have we based on the number of uh, what are you talking about in terms of regions? In terms of yeah, he, the yeah. seventy thousand is divided into various regions. Right, of the world, exactly. Right? But and we don't have. But, but I'm talking not, about specifically not the country about country. Specific, yeah, exactly. But I mean, they fit into the. Where do they fit in? Do they fit into the Middle East, the Near East region? They we do. Yeah, the Syria. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Do you, how many by the end of the year? Sorry, Barbara. It's okay. No, no. I mean, I think you. Indeed. No, I, that, that that was it. I just wanted. I just th think that if yeah. the 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 one question I asked first about the traditional role of accepting half the refugees approved for foreign resettlement is quite a big difference from that to fifteen hundred on a massive emergency refugee scale. So it just seems that's why I asked what what the sure what I, was behind that. I, I mean, I I think you know, and I said this before, we are the largest humanitarian donor. Uh, uh, to the Syrian conflict. We're helping refugees within Syria and outside of Syria. We recognize that other countries, and, and I've noted before, Turkey's uh, played a prominent role in accepting, I think, over 2 million uh, Syrian refugees. Uh, and uh, but not for resettlement. Not for resettlement, I, I agree. Um, but, uh, but this is an urgent situation, and we're looking at ways we can so, improve our response. But I think we're doing a lot. So please. Uh, one, can you tell us where you expect to be at the end of the month, the end of the fiscal year, on the 70 overall, and then on whatever the low, the, the breakdown number for near e for refugees? I have to get that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you check Take on that? that? And secondly, you've spoken several times now. You said by the end of this fiscal year. Yeah, I want to know how yeah. many you you have an allotment. You've set aside a seventy thousand spots, yeah. right? How many will be filled by the end of the year worldwide, and then also for the I can check. Region, I also would, frankly, um, how many of yeah? I would also encourage you. There is a a, a website um, uh, that has some of these statistics. It's called RAPSNet.org, and it does have uh, many of the statistics uh, on refugee admissions. So I would encourage everyone to. It's RAPS W R A P S Net. Dot org. And then, and then um, you've spoken several times to the urgency of this matter, and you've also welcomed the EU holding a meeting about this, but the EU meeting is on September 14th. Unless I'm wrong, as today is September 3rd. How urgent do you think the EU is actually ta taking, you know, thinks this problem is? Is this, is this okay with the U.S.? Um, I mean, if something is urgent, you generally schedule a meeting about it, you know, not 11 days away. Well, I, I think it speaks to, you know, uh, and frankly, uh, many EU leaders have, have spoken to this as well, to the fact that there needs to be a comprehensive approach. You've seen refugees arriving uh, from, uh, from the east, 
uh, to some of the countries, uh, Hungary, for example. Um, and frankly, uh, those are kind of frontline states dealing with this influx, mm -hmm. but there needs to be a more comprehensive. So we view this meeting as an opportunity to really uh, forge yeah, ahead. Shouldn't this be, if it's, if it's that urgent, shouldn't this well, be, let the be EU held yesterday? To, I'll let well, the EU you speak to that. But you welcomed it, so I want to. I do know, welcome is it, it because. Is this the kind of speed well, we would, that you think is We would acceptable? welcome it in the sense that it would uh, certainly uh, speak to uh, uh, the kind of comprehensive approach that we feel uh, needs to be applied here. Is the Hungarian government <laughs> handling the influx of refugees properly in the U.S.'s view? Properly or prop, prop, properly? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, well, again, I, I think I spoke to this a little bit uh, when, I, in, uh, when I was uh, before or prior. Um, you know, all countries have uh, the right, sovereign right to manage their borders. Um, but we would emphasize the need uh, to ensure that human rights are respected, that proper screening and registration procedures are in place. Uh, to allow these most vulnerable uh, people to receive appropriate assistance and protection. So The government has been accused of uh, changing the rules on how people can come into the country. First it said, well, you just need to have your passport, and now they're saying you need to have a certain kind of visa and it needs to have been processed in a certain way. And when we're talking about people who have you know, basically been on the run, you know, it seems as if you know, the rules have been changing before they could actually get to a place where they could try to figure out, okay, what's my next step, whether sure. it's trying to ask for asylum here or trying to get to family somewhere else? Well, I think there's no question, uh, as, as I said before, but there's, there's a very large number of extremely vulnerable uh, uh, migrants, uh, asylum seekers, uh, trying to get into Europe. Uh, and it does pose a serious and, frankly, a difficult challenge to EU nations uh, and other nations in the region. Um, and, uh, you know, it's clear that uh, these uh, groups continue to arrive, large numbers in Greece and Italy, uh, elsewhere, and that these people need appropriate uh, assistance. So we applaud steps, and we've seen this, of individual countries. Uh, some have taken to uh, humanely uh, accommodate these uh, refugees, these arrivals, these migrants. Uh, we certainly support the provision of humanitarian aid uh, and proper screening and registration uh, procedures. Uh, and I think, I think speaking more broadly to what I was saying about a comprehensive approach, there is this agenda on migration that the EU is, uh, is working to uh, complete that, mm -hmm. that does try to create this more uh, comprehensive response to the situation. Please. Are, are, right. the topic. The Washington Post are we done today? with the, yeah, yeah, please. Oh, okay. uh, let's finish on the topic, and then I'll get to you, I promise. All right, thank you. Please, go ahead. Because of the severity of the crisis affecting Europe, has there been any talk of looking at raising the level of U.S. funding to support the U.N. refugee effort? You mean the UNHCR? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, that's, uh, that's primarily, is my understanding, where our uh, humanitarian assistance, the, the $4.5 uh, that I mentioned, it's primarily uh, funneled through the uh, UNHCR. Um, you know, we're constantly reassessing what we can give to, it, to, to support uh, uh, its ongoing operations. Uh, it, it certainly uh, uh, does good work, uh, and, uh, and uh, as I said, it's the primary vehicle through which we, uh, we, uh, we uh, distribute our aid. Sorry. Please, so, uh, please. are we, are we still on? Syria. Yeah. Syria. Let's finish yeah. with Syria. I promise I'll get to you. Are you on Syria? Or you, yeah. Okay, great. So I think you have seen that the pictures of that the, the three-year-old kid, the island Kurdi, was circulated on the on the social media. Actually, the, her fam his family is from the city of Kuvani, and I, I remember several times I asked you and also John from this podium, uh, is there any way that you can help the the people, the areas that have been liberated, uh, including Kobani, Tel Aviv, and Jazeera and Afrin, that were, were most most of the areas that are controlled by YPG. And the answer was no. And uh, I know you, you help the Syrian refugees in Iraq, especially in the city of Duhok, and you help the Syrian refugees in Turkey and in Jordan and other areas. But what prevents you to help the Syrians? They, they live in their areas, but there's no, no resources that they, that they can you know, stay there. Uh, the city is destroyed. Uh, is there any way that you can help them inside, especially Kobani and Tel Aviv and other areas? I mean, uh, a couple of thoughts, and I hope we, our answer wasn't simply no. Um, what we've kind of. talked, to, <laughs> kind of, yeah. Um, you know, what we've spoken to before is, you know, once these areas are 
um, liberated uh, uh, by, as you mentioned, YPG. Uh, there's other forces uh, who are effective in uh, going after ISIL. Um, what we want to see is a return to normalcy, to, um, uh, to a, an open, uh, inclusive uh, government. Uh, we need to, and frankly, it's one of the lines of effort that we talk about all the time in our coalition our, against ISIL, is to reestablish uh, governance, good governance, civil society, that support that needs to come in, as you correctly say, on the heels of liberation uh, that, you know, allows, creates the condition that allows those refugees who want to return to return. So it's certainly something, now that said, in northern Syria, it's an extremely challenging environment, even more so than, than Iraq in some ways in terms of, you know, uh, that providing that kind of direct assistance. But uh, certainly it's something we're encouraging uh, those forces on the ground to, uh, to move towards. But also the, the civilians, they need support because if you just continue Agreed. to... Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 and again, this is, a, I, this is a part of our overall efforts. Uh, so you if, know. if you continue just to support the refugees in Iraq and in Syria, so you will just basically indirectly encouraging people to leave that area, to go there and to get assistance. But so uh, I, I, several times the, the civil administration in those areas, if you recognize them or not, the cantons, they are the people that they are running people's daily affairs. They ask for the support, uh, and that's the reason. It's not ISIS, it's uh, the severe economic situation that the, the people, the families. Well, in some uh, cases, it certainly is ISIS, and it's certainly Assad's uh, unrelenting attacks on his own people. Um, you know, that creates an untenable uh, environment. Uh, um, you know, I can give you the latest statistics, but the amount of, uh, of, of uh, Syrian citizens that Assad kills in any given week uh, is appalling. Uh, but you're absolutely right in the sense that the ultimate uh, objective here is to create the conditions on the ground that allows these refugees to return. But what, what prevents you to create that condition in, like, for example, Kobani is really right across the, the border with Turkey that you can just help the people uh, that, that they need the, the, the basic services. I mean, I think that's one, as I said, that's one of our lines of effort. We're trying to, to, to work in that regard. I'm not, I don't have specifics on Kobani. Uh, I can try to get them for you, but, uh, but no, we've said that many times. That's, you know, that's part of the, the five lines of effort against uh, ISIL. And one of them is clearly that kind of providing that support. And you, you're right to mention we've done that and spoken about it and what we've done to, to newly liberated areas in Iraq. Uh, because you want to see these populations be able to return. Are we done with Syria? Syria? Okay, sorry. So um, I haven't forgotten. Uh, State That's Department it. made a comment on ISIL's potential or reported use of chemical weapons, uh, that it was a reminder for the need of a diplomatic solution. Um, and you often use the word political transition. There's been a lot of activity around political transition. What What is this political transition looking like? I know you mentioned the peace process, but do you think this is culminating would you, do you envision this culminating in like a referendum or democratic elections? Sure. Also, like I know what you don't want. <laughs> we know what you don't want, but what, you know. Yeah, what sure. Do you uh, so I, I would just, I would uh, frankly refer you to um, uh, um, the uh, special representative for the UN, Di Mistura, uh, and also the Geneva communique, which does lay out kind of the, the process and how it would look. Um, you know, what we want to see is, uh, a moderate opposition uh, uh, coalesce. Uh, we want to see a political process take place that leads to a transition uh, away from Assad. And we've been very clear that we don't see the result of any kind of political resolution can include Assad. We view him as, frankly, the, uh, uh, the person who has helped create uh, the kind of climate that exists, not only against, you know, what, talking about this Assad regime's uh, abuses of his citizenry, but also creating the kind of environment that we see where groups like ISIL can uh, can thrive. So what we want to see, uh, I mean, I'm dumbing this down to some extent because, uh, as I said, there's many more people who are expert in this than I am, uh, certainly, uh, is this UN process uh, take place. Again, uh, a moderate Syrian opposition uh, arise, and for the aspirations and, 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 frankly, hopes of the uh, Syrian people uh, be realized in a transitional government that doesn't include Assad. The, back Please, to the attack ahead. real quick. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, yeah. I apologize. So the, the report of ISIL's use of chemical weapons, um, State Department, you know, they came out pretty strongly yesterday. But in general, these reports, why, why is your response mild when you compare it to 
Assad's use of chemical weapons. When those reports came forward, President Obama's making speeches every day, so is Kerry, to make the case against Assad, but we don't see the same urgency here. It well, seems. Well, I, I certainly don't want to uh, give away or give the sense that uh, we're not concerned uh, by these reports. Uh, you know, we're looking into them, we're investigating them uh, very seriously. Um, I, I, I can't speak to, uh, well, I can speak to the fact that any use by any party, uh, be it state or non-state actor, uh, of a chemical as a weapon of any kind is an abhorrent act, period. Uh, and frankly, you know, that kind of behavior would be consistent uh, with uh, ISIL's record of complete disregard for human rights. We've seen that countless times, as well as international norms and values. So we take these reports seriously, uh, and we'll continue to do our utmost to, to address uh, uh, our concerns and these concerns, the concerns of uh, the international community. Uh, but I don't have much to add beyond that. Um, Any you know, theories on where these chemicals came from? Um, no, I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, the declared, uh, you know, uh, uh, the declared weapons by uh, the Assad regime and what was undeclared. Uh, you know, we've always been concerned about ISIL's uh, interest and intent to acquire a chemical weapon, uh, but uh, I, I don't have any more details on, on where these might be coming from. Yeah, oh, Syria, Syria, and then we'll finish. I think we're kind of in Syria. We're in that gray zone yeah. between Syria and Iraq. I apologize if you've already addressed this because I haven't been here all week, but the reports that the Russians are ramping up their military presence in Syria with uh, military equipment or military personnel or military aircraft, depending on which report you read. Um, does does the administration see any evidence of that? Uh, well, um, we've seen uh, various press reports, uh, as you said, that, uh, that uh, Russia uh, may be deploying uh, military personnel or aircraft uh, to Syria. Uh, I can say we're monitoring that very closely. We're looking into it. Uh, we're in touch with our partners uh, uh, in the region uh, to try to get more information. Um, you know, we're unclear uh, what these might be intended for or whether this is actually uh, happening, uh, but certainly we would be concerned by any uh, attempt to uh, support uh, the Assad regime. Uh, with military personnel, with aircraft, with supplies of any kind, or funding, uh, because we view it as destabilizing and counterproductive. So that would be contradictory to Russia's moves to find some sort of political solution, which the State Department has been working Again, with. Again, and I would repeat what we've seen so far, uh, we're looking into. We've seen these press reports uh, and, uh, and are looking into them, but we would view that type of activity as, as I said, destabilizing and counterproductive. Just so we're clear, yes, sir. In the middle of that answer, you said um, you're unclear what these might be intended for or even whether or whether they are even happening. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely. Not even we don't have, no, we, we're okay. looking into these and we're talking, as I said, we're talking to our partners in the region. We're trying to get a clear understanding of, of what may be behind these well, reports. Are you talking to the Russians? Uh, <laughs> Well, when you say your partners in the region, I mean, it's great to talk to the Jordanians about what Russia might or might not be doing next door or the Israelis or whoever, but have you asked the Russians what they're exactly what they're doing? We have uh, our, our conveyed our, our, our All concerns. Right. And then just to make and then just to make sure that Please. just to put a fine point on this, that, that sure. you don't know if the Russians are supplying the Assad regime with troops or weapons or anything like that. But you do know that Iran is right. Yes. I mean, so, we've spoken about Iran support. So what for, happens? So what happens if you prove? What happens if you come come out and confirm that the Russians are supplying the uh, supplying Syria, Syria with uh, the Assad regime? With again, a, what we've said is we would, deal to? We, <laughs> we've said that uh, uh, sanctions relief is only related to <laughs> and is not so. What happens? Immediate. It's I, only if I, they comply with I, the. Obviously, I was being sarcastic. Yes. yes. But oh, what really? happened? Yeah. But if you if you no, do I, confirm, I just think. Again, is there a consequence for Russia if, they, in fact, they again we don't know? I know, but if the port is born, so out, you're asking is me there a consequence. You're asking me to respond to a hypothetical, which we're loath to do from the podium. Yeah. What I have said is, is that we we have said this in the past. Frankly, we see any support 
of military personnel, of equipment, of funding for Assad's regime that supports Assad's regime as counterproductive. Right, right. I know, but does it draw any consequence? Well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, what we want to see here is a, a political process, a peace, uh, peaceful settlement to the conflict in, in Syria, and we view that as uh, counterproductive to that. Sorry, just to did you Please. say you had conveyed your concerns about these reports to the Russians? I believe so. I have to check on that. But again, we're, we're still looking at yes. these reports, so I'm not sure that we've actually contacted them about them yet. China? Oh. I'll check. Um, you've mentioned previously that you had hoped that the Chinese military parade would be future-looking. Uh, now that China has concluded its VOJ commemoration ceremonies, did it live up to your expectations? Did it live up to our expectations? Um, well, again, um, uh, I, think, I think many of you, or hopefully all of you, saw the uh, Secretary's uh, statement uh, on the uh, uh, on the uh, 70th anniversary of the formal end of World War II uh, in the Pacific. Uh, you know, we honor and respect the sacrifices made by many nations, including China, 70 years ago. Uh, and we believe that all parties should take a reconciliatory approach to the uh, end of World War II. Uh, certainly, you know, as the president noted in his statement, uh, United States' relationship with Japan uh, over the last 70 years has been a model of the power of reconciliation. Uh, so I guess, you know, if, as I said I, or reiterated before, um, we certainly don't question or challenge Beijing's uh, right or authority to, uh, to host these kind of commemorative events. Um, and we've consistently shared with our Chinese counterparts our desire to see these types of events highlight the themes of reconciliation and healing. Yeah. And now, it, are we on this topic? Sorry, okay, go ahead. Are you on this topic? No, but if I could just. You've been waiting so long, and then yes. I promise. You. I want to follow up on it. I, I, I also want to. I'll um, get well, back to you guys. The Washington Post reported today that Brian Pagliano, a former Clinton campaign staffer, became an IT employee at the State Department while she was secretary. Is it unprecedented for a secretary of state's former campaign staffer, staffer to get an IT job at the State Department? And has Secretary Kerry employed any former can state campaign staffers as IT people at the State Department? Okay, that was a very quickly read question I'm sorry, um, with a lot of components yeah. to it. Um, so you're, you're uh, drilling down to your essential question. You were asking whether it was okay or if proper. It was unprecedented. For, it was unprecedented. For a Secretary of State's former campaign staffer to get an IT job at the State Department. And you could also put in there how many Secretaries of State were former presidential candidates. <laughs> Good question. Um, uh, uh, sorry, to answer your question, yes. um, I, I don't know that it was unprecedented. I, I think that uh, it, it depends on his qualifications. I, I can't speak to the hiring decisions of, uh, of former Secretary Clinton uh, or her staff. Um, you know, certainly uh, anyone who worked on her campaign, if they had the necessary skill set, would be uh, certainly uh, uh, welcome to apply for a, an IT job uh, anywhere, including the State Department. But I can't speak to... Uh, what decisions were made by, about that hiring at that time. That's something for uh, uh, for her staff or for her to answer. Um, so yeah, I have a couple of, no, hold on a second. If we're, gonna, if we're on Mr. Pagliano. I'm yeah, I know, I realize I, I, I opened the, please, let's go ahead. And then so, I promise I'll get to China, back to China. So are, are, do you have anything more to say about the military parade one way or another? No. Okay, I didn't think <laughs> so. So uh, Mr. Pagliano. Um, does the State Department have a problem with him through his lawyer saying he's going to um, plead the Fifth Amendment or take the Fifth Amendment uh, when he's, uh, he's sure. asked to appear? I mean, you know, I mean, our uh, desire, our commitment throughout this has been to cooperate with the Benghazi Committee uh, <clears throat> and to be responsive to congressional inquiries, which I believe and we believe we have been. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we certainly respect the constitutional rights of individuals. So, well, uh, you know. All right. So his status right now is that he is an, a, a, a contractor and he's still working at the State Department, but not employed by the State Department. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So he was just to uh, share what I have uh, on him. He was employed by the State Department from May 2009 through February 2013 uh, as an IT specialist. Uh, and now he ser currently serves as a contractor working in the Bureau of Info right. Information Resource Management. If, in fact, the department, and I really, this is just 
I don't know. If, in fact, the department is encouraging employee, he's being asked to testify or to speak to or to talk to the committee about his time when he was working for the State Department. I don't think they care what he did necessarily after 2013. Why is it that you would not encourage him to actually answer their questions? Why do you not have, why do you not have an issue with him pleading taking the Fifth Amendment? Well, because A, it's his constitutional right, and B, he has his own lawyer and his own counsel. And well, Yeah, but if you want to be truly open, why, I'm not saying that you could force him to, but what, Well, that's why, what I, I mean, I, sorry, we are, this department is committed to being responsive, well, that, but uh, both if, to the but committee not, as well as congressional inquiries. So, so have, you, it, have you said, hey, we think it would be a good idea for you to go up there and answer the question? I mean, the campaign says that they have told I'm them. I'm aware of what the campaign has said. So what but, about this building? I mean, if the building is seriously honest uh, is honest and about seriously wanting to address all the issues that, that, they're, that the committee is asking, it would seem to me that you would tell this guy, hey, we can't force you, but we think that it, it would be a good idea for you to get up there and and to answer their questions and not sure. I mean, first of all, we weren't consulted Amendment. by uh, uh, about his decision, and again, he has his own legal counsel. Yeah, but he works in this building right now. I mean, not for the bill. Or but again, we didn't. We were not building. aware uh, or consulted about this decision. Uh, we didn't have any okay. contact with all him. Right. Well, then yeah. now at this at this moment in time, though, would you say that you that, that would the would people in this building like him? whether you can force them or not, to answer the committee's questions. Again, um, I, I just stay where I, where I was, which is that uh, we respect the constitutional rights of individuals, uh, and that is, you know, asserting one's Fifth Amendment is a constitutional right. So, so if someone, so if a current or former department employee goes, goes, up, goes up there, and 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 refuses to answer questions that's not an issue for you it, it whether it is or isn't it's their constitutional right to do well, so i know but it wouldn't I mean, if you have nothing to hide and you want to come clean or come clean that's a bad word it is if you yeah, if you if, if you really have nothing to hide why wouldn't you encourage this person to to answer the questions as the campaign has said, encourage somebody to voluntarily give up their I'm not encouraging. Rights. Wait, yeah, right, for precisely. I mean, that, in that sense, you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm saying we're not, we weren't consulted in this decision. He has pleaded uh, the fifth, so to speak. Uh, it's certainly not an admission of guilt, uh, as we all know, uh, but it's his constitutional right. So, you know, we respect that. And I, I have a, I, I'd asked you a question the other day, uh, and you said you'd give me an answer to it. And the question Did is I? whether <laughs> the uh, Foreign Affairs Manual applies to secretaries of state. Uh, does it? So, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I did do some research into this, as, as did others. Um, it is... It, the Foreign Affairs Manual is um, is not um, comprehensive, in uh, 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 nor is it a Bible for all uh, foreign service officers or civil servants. So, and what I what do I mean by that? I mean, it's it's not um, you know. For example, there's things in there about reimbursement of the use of your private vehicle. Certainly that doesn't apply to the Secretary of State uh, or many people within the State Department. So it, it's what's contained in the Foreign Affairs Manual, and this is, a, I apologize, but this is a, a, a kind of an in-the-weeds question. All of that is not necessarily relevant to, for example, ambassadors or Secretaries of State or senior department officials. I mean, I, if I can say what I think the, the essence of your question was, and I'm sorry if this is presumptive, but was whether they are bound by uh, the responsibility to protect classified information. That certainly is true, that any Secretary of State, any senior to State Department official is bound by that. And I spoke to this the other day, is that um, you know any individual, whether you're the Secretary of State on down, uh, uh, takes that responsibility seriously. But my question, yeah. um, I mean, I really, I, I, I was not asking whether uh, they were bound by every aspect of it, including those that are not relevant to them. It was whether they're they're bound 
basically whether they're bound by the things that are relevant to them. So to take the one that you raised, which is not whether they're bound to protect classified information or to take seriously the responsibility to protect classified information, uh, the, the, the question would be then, since you raised that as a specific, are they bound, are secretaries of state bound by the rules in the Foreign Affairs Manual with regard to the handling of classified information? Um, I would say, as, as as they are pertinent to the, uh, uh, and again, I don't have the Foreign Affairs Manual in front of me, but as they are pertinent to the responsibility to protect and safeguard classified information, and we've talked about this, uh, frankly, ad nauseum about the gradations and how we classify stuff and how we look at it, but as those uh, rules that apply to uh, all, everyone in the, in the State Department, uh, including, uh, for example, politically appointed ambassadors, and certainly by Secretary of State, who is appointed by the President and, frankly, serves at uh, the pleasure of the President and is not a, a Foreign Service officer in that regard and, you know, uh, or a civil servant. So insofar as the regulations of the Foreign Affairs Manual touch on the protection of classified information, they apply to everyone, including the Secretary of State? Again, um, I, I don't have it in front of me, but it, 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 and I'm not trying to parse this, but I, in a sense I am, uh, as, as insofar as those regulations apply to the protection and safeguarding of classified information, yes. Thank you. I didn't see that to me. I, okay. I just want to go, no, go back to <laughs> Pagliano for one second. And, and that is, so, <clears> you, I, you, so you weren't consulted. Um, does the State Department have any equity in, 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 in uh, what he might have said, should he, or might say, should he decide to, act, to, to speak? I mean, would you, would you like to have someone present for him? And then um, non-hypothetically, um, Cheryl Mills is up uh, before the committee today. Was there anyone from the State Department with her or in attendance? Um, it seems to me that you would have an interest, at least, in, in what you said. I don't know if the committee would allow them in, but uh, did you have anyone or did you try to get anyone in there to hear what she might say? Um, on uh, In the case of uh, Cheryl Mills testifying, uh, I'll have to check on that. I don't believe we had anybody uh, in the in the meeting with her. Um, in your first question, I'm sorry, Matt. Well, in, in, in both, oh, whether in, we in, have, and yeah. in both cases with both people, and in in terms of Jake Sullivan tomorrow, um, are they they have uh, attorneys? I presume their they own ones, but they is do. there any State Department legal involvement? In this? Um, I don't believe so. Um, you know what I would say. Sorry, going back to you know uh, both uh, Cheryl Mills and Jake Sullivan. Uh, you know, as I said before, we're committed, obviously, to cooperating with uh, the Benghazi Committee. Uh, and, you know, that certainly includes, uh, that would include facilitating the testimony, their testimony, the testimony of former officials, uh, and that would include access to uh, their State Department records. Um, and, but this is what we've done with, I think, 30-some-odd uh, witnesses who've already appeared for, before the committee. But as to being somebody, be, having someone in the room, I don't believe so, but I'll double check on that. Well, okay, if you if that applies to them, and they are former officials, why does it also not apply to the, Mr. Pagliano? Again, he he is. So, uh, but are you facilitating his testimony? We weren't well? consulted. He and he has counsel. So no one so, from yeah. so so the committee never approached you about him. Um, I believe not, but okay. I have to check on that. Yeah, oh, let's finish with this. I promise. Sorry, um, there's uh, there's now a report that. Um, uh, Mr. Pagliano has uh, also decided, it's a Yahoo News report that he has also decided, he's also declined to speak to the FBI and to <coughs> the State Department Inspector General um, uh, invoking his Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate himself. I just want to make sure that your answer uh, applies to those two other bodies as well, the IG and the FBI, if he wants to invoke his right to, uh, you know, his Fifth Amendment rights with them, that's fine with you, too. Correct? Well, I, I, fine his, with me. I mean, choice. it's, I, right, I, I'm not, yeah, right, I mean, that's a little glib. Um, I, I, I think what we're, it's his choice, exactly, and he has legal counsel, he has sought legal counsel, he has made his decision. Thanks. Please, go ahead. 
So the Bureau of Industry and Security has added 29 Russian uh, persons, that includes companies, to the sanctions list. And uh, it says, uh, quote, the BIS IS is taking this action to ensure the efficacy of existing sanctions on the Russian Federation for violating international law and fueling uh, the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Uh, end of quote. Uh, what does Russia do in Ukraine right now that warrants an update of sanctions? Um, I, I'm uh, sorry, you said you mentioned who was it behind the upgrade in sanctions? I apologize. I missed the first part the of your Bureau question. Bureau of Industry and Security. Bureau of Industry and Security here in the United no, States? Yes. Okay. Oh, right, the Commerce Department. I, I apologize. I just didn't. Um, I, I, I believe, and I, I, may, uh, I may be wrong, but I believe this is in line with ongoing sanctions uh, strengthening and what we talked about a couple weeks ago here, which is, you know, when we're constantly um, uh, freshening our sanctions and our sanctions are in place because of uh, Russia's uh, behavior support for the separatists, ongoing support for the separatists in eastern Ukraine. Uh, and we want to keep those sanctions as current as possible. Uh, in any kind of sanctions regime, there's obviously uh, workarounds uh, uh, that develop over time. So we constantly look at those and uh, ways to strengthen them and close those kind of workarounds in order to keep them uh, both uh, uh, knitted up with uh, EU sanctions uh, as well as Canadian sanctions, but also to uh, make sure that they're airtight, for lack of a better term. Uh, as I understand from what you said, you know, they're not indefinite, they're conditional, right? They are conditional. Uh, what yeah. what violations by Russia at this point, right now, warrant such such tightening, the strengthening of the sanctions? Uh, again, uh, it, it, uh, if, again, if we're talking about Ukraine, specific yeah, what, to Eastern Ukraine, I mean, we've Russia seen, right what we've now, seen is, exactly. sorry, I mean, um, we've seen, um, um, frankly, uh, writ large, uh, a lack of serious effort to comply with any of the commitments uh, uh, that Russia and the separatists have made regarding Minsk. Um, and we've seen ongoing violations of the ceasefire. And I know we've been back and forth on that or who's to blame for that. We believe the preponderance of those ceasefire violations are on the part of uh, separatist forces, again, supplied uh, and uh, and also uh, helped by uh, Russian uh, military. Can you give some specifics, exactly what violations, what ceasefire, why, how is Russia involved? Well, I mean, I, again, I mean, I can, you know, we've got, uh, you know, uh, many examples. Uh, obviously, I'd refer you to the OSCE. Uh, their monitors are on the ground. Uh, and uh, their uh, mandate, or their, their sorry, Russia their... Is but their, sorry, that. let me so finish. Their mission decide? is to uh, look at uh, and uh, survey uh, all of the uh, uh, disputed territory, uh, but also to monitor the ceasefire, which is an essential part of the Minsk uh, commitments. Uh, we've seen a new ceasefire come into effect today. Uh, uh, we hope that that uh, will bear fruit uh, and solidify. Uh, we've seen uh, relative calm today, but, um, you know, I think we've, uh, uh, we've continued to see violations uh, on the part of uh, Russia and a part of the separatists. Um, and to that, that regard, right? sure, can I can, yes. Um, if you want to wait while I get to it, I'm happy to give you uh, chapter and verse. Um, I mean, first of all, the larger picture. There would be no conflict in eastern Ukraine if Russia were not providing tanks, armored vehicles, heavy artillery, military personnel to the separatists. I think we all understand that. We've, uh, we've uh, made that very clear uh, over many months, uh, including showing uh, satellite imagery that shows uh, Russian troops command and control on the ground in eastern Ukraine. Do you, do you uh, have they've the seized... recent, very recent images? Sure, we do. Um, I, I don't have them in front of me. Um, but, uh, you know, we've seen continue uh, destabilizing actions on the part of Russia in eastern Ukraine. Um, we have now have this ceasefire in place, uh, but we remain concerned about further ceasefire uh, activities. But yeah, please. There, no, 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 no specifics yet. What, what exactly, what, what violations do you, 
do you do you ha have any in front of you? Because you know, by many accounts, this has been the calmest, um, I can say, a week for sure, and probably the whole year. That's that's and not true. I mean, we've seen repeatedly uh, within the past months, uh, uh, Russian uh, separatist forces have launched uh, dozens of attacks across the line of control, killing more than a dozen Ukrainian soldiers, uh, injuring dozens of others. Uh, you know, I was very clear. There is a new uh, ceasefire initiative uh, set in place today, uh, frankly, on the part of the Ukrainian government. We hope that holds. Uh, uh, we're cautiously optimistic, uh, but we haven't, you know, we, we have, as we've seen in the past, uh, these uh, ceasefire violations continue, and the vast majority of them are on the part of the separatists. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you have a question? I, well, I have a question on, on sanctions, uh, but it's Russia and China. Um, oh, okay. The, Financial Times has a story out today citing, just out, citing three U.S. officials as saying that um, the United States is, and let me get the exact language, preparing to sanction Chinese companies connected to <clears throat> the cyber theft of U.S. intellectual property as early as next week. It cites the officials as saying the sanctions would probably be next week before President Xi's trip, that uh, the United States is also considering sanctions against Russian individuals and companies for cyber attacks. Um, is that right? Are you actually considering sanctioning the Chinese next week? Um, so, uh, as you know, what sir, was in the Washington Post? Right? Well, the Chinese thing they said within the next they said within the next two weeks, and now we've got another report suggesting it's next week. So, so as I you know, guess when right. it comes to economic sanctions, we don't. Uh, Preview uh, any kind of uh, uh, any kind of sanctions uh, beforehand, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, you know we don't want to uh, give a heads up to uh, uh, to those who may be potential targets of economic sanctions to begin to take steps to evade well, uh, sanctions activity. Them to the Financial Times. What's that? Three U.S. officials previewed them to the Financial I Times. I can't speak to you know people speaking on background or leaking information. Uh, you know, that's, and, and by saying that you're not frankly a, an unfortunate reality of the world we live in. By by saying that you're not suggesting that there will be any action exactly. taken next I, week. I, I certainly have nothing to announce. Uh, you know, I think we've spoken very clearly uh, about you know the executive order the president signed that uh, gives authority to the secretary of the treasury so he can impose sanctions on against those who carry out cyber attacks, and we uh, obviously. Uh, raise our concerns about China's activity in this sphere. That executive order gives the authority to the Secretary of Treasury, correct? That's correct. Not to so the I would, yes, I would. <laughs> so are questions about this best directed to you at this podium or to the Treasury Department? I would, I would encourage you to okay. reach right. out to Can the I ask, I've got Department three very, very brief ones on the Mideast, and I know you're going to doubt that they're brief, but they are, actually. <laughs> One is, I just wanted to know, I asked you the other day about um, a report, um, NGO report about UNRWA, yeah, and I'm sorry. I apologize. I have not. I, I apologize. Uh, that's on right. me. Okay, can, I will get you an answer before right. the end of the day today. Secondly, Mark there, apparently that, will, there was an incident. That's my bad. I apologize. Okay. Seriously. Uh, there was an incident today in Hebron where five yep. uh, American students were attacked with a firebomb. They're apparently okay, but I'm just wondering if you Yeah, know. I mean, obviously, um, so you're right. We're just getting the details uh, just for walking out here. Condemn any acts of violence. Uh, and continue to urge all parties to take steps to decrease tensions uh, and refrain from provocative acts and uh, and rhetoric. Okay, uh, but you you don't have any more details. I don't have more details. Uh, and then lastly, there are some calls in the Israeli government to for their um, uh, I guess I don't know what you call them rules of engagement. I don't know if, uh, how to deal with uh, how police deal with um, stone throwers with some calls for uh, the police to be able to use live fire. Do, have you, one, are you aware of this? And two, if you are, have you said anything to the Israelis about it? Do you have any opinion one way or the other? Or is this just a strictly internal um, matter for them to deal with? I mean, um, you know, obviously uh, it's up to the uh, Israeli government to make decisions about its security and its, uh, uh, but, you know, as we often say in these cases, uh, uh, you know, we would ask uh, all parties or all sides to uh, uh, to show restraint. Uh, that said, uh, I don't know that we've conveyed that directly to the Israeli government. I just don't have that information. Okay, can, can you find out? And sure. also, if the specific, if the specific, if uh, if your call for all Res sides yeah. to be showing restraint 
would that include you calling for the Israelis not to use live fire against uh, people, some of them who often are, are, are teenagers, throwing stones? Okay. Thanks. Let me go back to China. Yeah, let's finish with China. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, South Korean President Park was one of the guests of honor at the uh, military parade. And uh, this, her attendance is seen as a sign that the relations between the two countries are growing stronger. And uh, do you have any concern at all that uh, South Korea, which is one of the key U.S. allies, is getting too close to China? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's a sovereign decision for the Republic of South Korea to make. Uh, obviously, we would encourage uh, strong relations uh, in the region, uh, and we consider South Korea to be a strong uh, partner and ally. Do you support good relations between Korea and China? Do I? I, I think I answered that. I mean, that's a, that's a decision for the government of South Korea to make, uh, how it relates to other countries in the region. Certainly, uh, as much dialogue, as much cooperative uh, or cooperation there can be between uh, South Korea and China on a range of issues uh, affecting the region, uh, I think is for the betterment of the region. One more. Yeah, please. Um, I don't know if you saw the reports of, I think it was five Chinese ships in the Bering Strait in international waters. Um, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> what are my thoughts? Um, <laughs> it's well put. Um, uh, no, we're aware, obviously, of the, uh, the ships, the five, as you said, People's Liberation Army Navy uh, ships uh, in the Bering Sea. Uh, this is certainly the first time we've observed uh, Chinese Navy ships in the Bering Sea. Uh, but uh, that said, we do certainly respect the freedom of all nations to operate military vessels in international waters in accordance with international law. Why, why the that said? Not that said. I mean, I'm just saying that, you know, we would, we, sorry, I didn't mean to add added emphasis to that. I'm just saying that we, we believe that they have the right to be there as long as they're uh, operating in accordance with international law. Please. Um, when President Park Geun-hye met with President Xi Jinping, they agreed to hold a trilateral summit with Japan uh, later this year. Uh, what? How does the U.S. view this, and uh, what role uh, do you anticipate? You're talking a trilateral on? summit between uh, China, China Japan, Japan, and South Korea. And South Korea. Later this year. I would transfer all my uh, remarks that I just said to, about the, to the gentleman about South Korea and closer relations to the same thing. Look, we, you know, we consider ourselves, as you all well know, the United States considers itself to be an Asian power. We're deeply uh, rooted in Asia. Uh, we've spoken to that many times. Uh, but you know, as much as we, uh, as much as there can be increased cooperation between the other countries in uh, Asia, that's uh, we believe uh, to the betterment of the region. And what about or the Pacific power. Pacific power? Thank you. And what about the well, role when that you say you're deep, Pacific power? Sorry. When you're deep, you say you're deeply rooted in Asia. What, is that what's Hawaii I mean, part we, of Asia? Now? We're we're, we're, we're Pacific. Sorry. And what about the role that you anticipate the U.S. to have? Uh, I'm not aware okay. of our role. Please. Awesome. Yesterday, when President Xi Jinping gave the remarks, and he mentioned no matter how much stronger China may become, China will never seek hegemony or expansion. And at the same time, he also announced um, the military reduction by 300,000. What is your reaction to that? And is that some um, gesture the United States would welcome China to take? You, you said uh, he, he, he announced a, a reduction. The military reduction uh, by 300,000 personnel. Personnel. PLA. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, that's uh, ultimately a decision for, you know, the Chinese government to make uh, with regards to its own national security, its own, uh, you know, military planning. Uh, we don't have any particular comment to that. And then way back. Uh, and I just have a question on uh, religious persecution in the Middle East, if we, if we can go back to that. Um, the Archbishop Bishop of Iraq says that what's happening to Christians at the hands of ISIS and in other areas of the Middle East is nothing short of genocide. Can you just go over the U.S. policy regarding persecuted Christians um, who are looking to enter the Uni United States? Persecuted Christians uh, from Iraq who are looking to enter yes. into the United yes. States, you mean seek asylum here? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, I don't have an update, frankly. I mean, certainly, you know, uh, speaking broadly, we take religious freedom very seriously. Um, you know, we believe, I mean, it's no surprise ISIL would, uh, is just uh, carrying out brutal attacks and treating these uh, individuals uh, with its trademark brutality. 
Um, but uh, I, I don't have specific figures if that's what you're looking for mm -hmm. in terms of policy. I mean, uh, asylum seekers come in all uh, uh, religions, all uh, uh, um, you know, all races, uh, all political leanings. Uh, what what matters is that you know is that we look at their cases individually and whether they have compelling reasons to seek asylum. But I don't have specific details on that. I can try to get more. And then, um, real, Please. can I to ask a follow-up to that? The, the organization um, Minority um, Human Humanity Foundation um, says that 27 Iraqi Christians fleeing persecution by ISIS are detained in, San Di in a San Diego jail for illegally entering the U.S. Um, why are they deemed political refugees instead of illegal immigrants? Have you heard about that? Why aren't they deemed, or why are they deemed political? I, I just don't have the specifics of the case. I'll have to, I, and frankly, it's it may be a DHS case. I'm not trying to. Uh, push you away here, but uh, I'll have to look into it. Thank you. Yep, thanks.